Chapter One of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. Chapter One First Reel. Grundy Center, Iowa, March 5. Dear Clara Bell, I guess by this time you have seen in the weekly that I have won the prize as the most beautiful girl in Dubuque County. It came as an awful surprise to me. I sent in my photograph, but you could have knocked me flat with a feather when I found that I was the winner. I didn't know I was so swell. If I had known I was to have won, I would have had a good photograph taken that looked like me. As it was, Hicks jabbed my head into one of those iron wishbone things, and I nearly choked to death. The first thing I knew about winning the prize was when someone rushed into the parlor of Martha Williams' home, where us members of the Apollo Dramatic Club were rehearsing, the Lady of Lyons, and right in the middle of my big scene, congratulated me. It certainly was some surprise to certain persons, you and I know, who think they are beautiful to gaze upon. I guess you know who I mean, Clara Bell. There are a lot of our most fashionable set, girls that thought red hair was horrible, that have just chewed their fingernails down to the quick since they heard. My picture is to be in one of the Chicago papers, Sunday, as Dubuque County's fairest flower. Oh, I forgot to tell you what the grand prize is. I have three choices, a life subscription to the weekly, a trip to Chicago, or ten dollars cash. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and I don't want you to breathe a word of it to a soul. I am going to be a moving picture actress, and act out before the camera. I saw an advertisement in the paper the other day, How to be a Mary Pickford in Ten Lessons for Ten Dollars, and I'm going to send the ten I won as the prize, and take the course. I have sold tickets now at this old bijou dream for four months, and I'm getting so I tear off a strip of whatever I have in my hand every time I see a dime. And would you believe it, my neck is so stiff from trying to watch Charlie Chaplin and sell tickets at the same time, I have to rub it with liniment every night. Mr. Gottlieb told me just yesterday, between the two real Morris Costello and the one real Helen Holmes, that I would make a grand movie actress. Although, through jealousy, I only get maid parts with the Apollo Dramatic Club. Both father and mother say I am a grand actress, and Uncle Will calls me his little Sarah Bernhardt. I stood on my head one night over at Mary Wilson's and practiced turning cartwheels at the YMCA gym, and after I rehearse a while, jumping off of bridges, and stopping runaway horses, and take this ten dollars worth of Mary Pickford, I am going out to California and accept an engagement. Of course, I get good money in the business end of the moving pictures, six dollars every week, no matter what comes in. But my soul yearns for the artistic. Mr. Gottlieb can just sell his own tickets. Oh, Clara Bell, won't it be just grand to be out there in California, where all the moving picture actors and actresses live, and hobnob with them, and be their equal? I can hardly wait for my first lesson. I have enough money saved for my salary, selling tickets at this here old film bazaar, to take me to California, and you bet I will have some more saved up before I leave. Of course, I don't expect to be a five-reel feature at first. I think I will have to start as a one-reel comic, and work my way up, reel by reel. You know that I have been seeing so many pictures since I've been working here, that even every one of the passed by the National Board of Censors seems to me like a dear friend, even though the censors do cut out the best parts. Mr. Gottlieb tells me it is no cinch being a movie picture actress, and I can see that, but I am strong and willing. Didn't I work for a month in the Palace Hotel dining room, and goodness knows you have to be strong to lug in what those drummers order, and willing to work for nothing except fresh remarks. They tell me that Mary Pickford gets four thousand dollars a week. I know I am going to be all right, but until I am able to show the directors how good I am, I am willing to take only a thousand a week, and pay my own streetcar fare to and from the studio. We'll write and tell you all about the lessons, but must close now because here comes a dime. Love, Molly. In route, April 6. Dear Clara Bell, Well, here I am bound for California, and believe me, I had an awful time getting started. In the first place, I certainly had my troubles getting the ten dollars out of the weekly. They told me how much good a life subscription to the paper would have done, and when I wouldn't take that, they wanted to give me a round-trip ticket to Chicago, on some excursion, but me for the boundless west. When I finally got the ten, mostly in small change, I sent right away to the moving picture school man, 
and got my whole Mary Pickford course in one shipment, collect. The lessons are hard, but certainly complete. I feel that they have done me a world of good, even if they did nearly kill me. The first thing the lessons taught was to get accustomed to act before the camera. Any camera would do, the book said, so I took Brother George's brownie. Then the book said not to look into the lens while acting. You could not act and do that, Clarabelle, because you have to peek into a little hole to see the lens, and you couldn't move your arms or nothing. There was a long chapter telling how to be familiar with any role, from a street waif to the pampered daughter of wealthy parents. You know what a chance I had rehearsing with Pa as a millionaire parent when he shucks his shoes and coat as soon as he strikes the house after work. I even had to go over to Cousin Esther's to rehearse my work-girl scenes, because Mother has a weak heart, and if she saw me do anything around the house, the shock might injure her for life. Another lesson taught me how to rehearse for death-defying stunts. That's where I used all the arnica, and I'm sure lucky to be here to tell the tale. When I got up after leaping from that rapidly moving milk wagon, I nearly decided to forsake my artistic career and go back to work. There was nothing nowhere in the lessons about using arnica. But I guess I did not step out of the character by using it, as I was, according to the book, supposed to be carried to a hospital, and there nursed back to life, by a dashing young doctor, with an automobile, and a mission. Finally, I finished all my lessons, and sent a quarter more to the professor, and got a handsome diploma, tied with blue ribbon. The letter with it said all that I had to do was to show it to any picture director, and I would know right where I belonged. When I had enough money saved up for my ticket to California, and some left over, I just up and told the folks that fame was waiting me, and left them flat. The whole town was down, as usual, to see number six hesitate. Mother cried a little. I kissed the total population of Grundy Center goodbye. Bill, the new conductor, waved his hand, and I was off to pastures new. Of course, Grundy Center is an up-to-date burg, as everybody knows, but so that I would not be taken for any farmer's bride or boarding school miss, I sent right to Chicago, and got the latest Paris creation from Sears Roebuck. You won't believe me when I tell you that the outfit, including the hat, of course, cost me fifteen dollars eighty-five cents, without express charges. My dear, it is a silk sand-colored suit, very full skirt, thank heavens, and a broad crimson belt. The hat matches the belt, and I wore black low shoes and red silk stockings. The only way that I can tell you how it becomes me is to simply say that everyone turned to look as I walked down the aisle of the train. I am traveling right in the sleeping car all the way. After you go to bed, they take the stairs out. This paper I am writing on is free. Father bought me the Pullman ticket as a birthday present, so all I had to do was to pay my railway fare. I am a regular traveler by now, and sit right out on the observation platform, and eat the lunch Mother put up for me. Fried chicken and everything. They have a cafe on the train, but I only go in there for breakfast, and even then, you have to buy more than a quarter's worth, whether you can eat it or not. I met a couple of nice traveling gentlemen on the train, nothing like the fresh drummers that sit with their feet up on the Palace Hotel porch railing and sigh for the gay life of Dubuque. They were real kind to me, and pointed out all the points of interest, and when I told them I was going to be a movie star, one said he'd get more fun out of seeing me act than Blanche Sweet. We are traveling through a part of California now, and will be in Los Angeles a couple of hours, so I will close and write you as soon as I get settled. We are going through the orange groves now, and the snow must be all gone, as I haven't seen none under the trees. Love, Molly. End of chapter 1「This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. » Chapter 2 of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Reel Los Angeles, California, May 11th Dear Clara Bell, At last I am in California, where all the moving pictures are made. Of course, you received my souvenir postal cards of the orange groves and the old mission I sent you, but this is the first time I had a chance to take my pen in hand and write you a letter. I have been so busy before this, but now my feet are so tired, I just got to stay home to rest. I guess Ma was right when she told me not to get sevens. I've been wearing eights. I have been to several studios, but as yet have not selected the ones in which I shall work. I have not seen any celebs yet, as they work all day and Ma told me not to go out alone nights in the Wild West. 
Los Angeles is a funny town. Everybody is trying to sell you something. A conductor on a streetcar tried to sell me a ticket to vote for a queen of something, and every night in the place where I eat, the firemen and policemen come in and try to sell me votes, too. Oh, I must tell you about the funny places to eat. Deary, you stay close to the eating house, for a waitress would starve to death out here. Everybody waits on herself. I hope to die if this is not the truth. You go in, grab off a big tray, and then run around and find what you want to eat. But you don't have to wash your own dishes. Los Angeles is much larger than Dubuque, or Galena, and everyone that lives there says it will soon be the biggest city in the world. They believe it, too. Most of the moving pictures are made in a suburb called Hollywood, and after looking up the address of the studios, the day after I got here, I went out. It's towards the Pacific Ocean. I got the shock of my life when I stepped off the streetcar. Down the street came a man on horseback, like sixty, and turning in the saddle every minute to shoot back over his shoulder. Back of him came some cowboys shooting furiously. I hollered and ran up a porch. Some men standing in a little group to one side off the street, I hadn't saw them before, begun to laugh. Clarabelle, they were taking a scene of a moving picture. They were taking it with a big box on three legs and a man who turned a crank at one side of the box. A little further on, I saw a girl being kidnapped in an automobile, but this time I saw the man with the box, so I knew no fond mother was losing her darling. They take moving picture scenes on the street and in vacant lots around here all day long. I saw three different kind of murders before I had gone two blocks. I will tell you how they go to it in my next. I went to what they told me was the studio, but it was not a studio at all like what we read about in the Chicago Sunday papers. There were no paintings or divans or mirrors. Just a big old place with a high board fence around it and a little place marked office in one corner. I tried to peek through a crack in the fence, but could not see anything. Finally, I followed some people into the office and saw a little window marked employment. I went up to the woman standing behind the window and asked to see the director. That is what the Mary Pickford lessons told me to ask for. The lady said, Which director do you care to inspect? I said, Any. Then she said, Dearie, take a tip from me and run right out of here. None of our directors have been fit company for a wildcat for two weeks, and as it's raining, they're getting worse. I told her that I was willing to accept an engagement in moving pictures if the salary was large enough, and she told me she would take my name and telephone me when they had heard from the New York office on my proposition. How long does it take to get an answer from New York, I wonder? I went to several other studios, and they were just alike, except that I don't believe they have to write New York when engaging a star. In one place, I got to talking to several girls, and they told me all the family gossip about the actors and directors. We'll tell you all about it pretty soon, and you will certainly have some idols cracked. But those sevens hurt, so now I must go to bed. Lovingly yours, Molly. P.S. I carried my Mary Pickford diploma to show the directors, like the book said. But as yet, I had not been even near enough to a director to have thrown it to him. Molly. Hollywood, March 17th. 1915. Dear Clara Bell, Dearie, I have been in a picture. And who do you think I played opposite? J. Warren Kerrigan. Honest. Though, of course, he was on the opposite side of the street, and I was in a howling mob on the other side. He is the grandest man, and he actually spoke to me. He is a dear, so full of sympathy. He said to me, he said, Dearie, if you don't stop acting so hard, you will strain something. Right during rehearsal it was, and Mary and Stella, two girls I met, heard him. I was just all over confusion, and I could feel myself blush a foot under the skin. When I got home that night, I bought all the souvenir postal cards of him I could find. I have not signed up with any company as yet, but you can bet when I do, Jack is going to be my leading man. While I was trying to decide which company to go with, one of the girls where I board, a nice place, and only six a week, took me out to Universal City, and I went on in a scene right in the same picture with Jack. That Universal City is sure a nice place. You go out to Hollywood on the streetcar, and then take a jitney over Cahuenga Pass to the city. A jitney, my dear, is an automobile you can ride in for a nickel. And I have just had the most delightful times motoring about, here and there. And if it wasn't for the big signs on the front end, people would think it was your own car. And would you believe it? In the restaurant I ate only two tables from King Baggett's. He's got the loveliest gray eyes. At the city, it is all white, like an amusement park. They have got a hospital and a big restaurant where you eat, and buildings where big revolving things dry the film, and miles and miles of stages for the people to act out on. 
The scenes are put on the stages like they are in theaters. They don't use real houses at all. All the scenes in one set, that's what they call the rooms, are taken at one time. One man told me he got thrown out of a door in one scene and didn't expect to land on the other side for a week yet. That must be what the doctors call suspended animation that I've been reading about. It is funny how conceited some of these actors and actresses are, Clara Bell. Everyone thinks everyone else is getting by on a mistake. I heard a man here say that he was the only director in the world who could make real funny pictures. How about those there Keystones and Charlie Chaplin? A fellow asked. Oh, they're pretty good, too. I never knock people when they are doing the best they can, he said. Don't you think that man had a large heart to be so kind to the other poor directors? They were awful glad to see me when I got out there, although I did not show my diploma or give my real name. When I went up to the window, the man said, Thank goodness, we have been looking for mob stuff all morning, and you are just the type. I started to show him the clipping about winning the beauty prize, but he said, I haven't time for post-mortems now. Come around Sunday. He must have made a mistake in the day, for no one works Sunday. He gave me a card, and then the girl I was with led me inside. My, but it was a big place. There were a lot of buildings with carpenters working inside, making scenery, and then the big long stage I told you about, where lots of people were working at acting. But we did not stop there, but went on around a hill to where the animals are. Clarabelle, they have a regular circus. Elephants, lions, and tigers, and the cutest monkeys. They take the animal pictures in a big steel cage, and the man with the camera and the director stand outside and tell the animals inside what to do. The only chances the director ever takes is catching a cold. We did not have time to stop long at the animals, for the man came dashing along and said, Beat it to where you belong. We went over in front of a building, and there was Mr. Kerrigan. He just looked so proud and handsome, every inch an actor. Mr. Cheney, the director, and the cameraman, climbed up on a platform, and us extra people were herded over on the other side of the street, by some fresh assistant director. Now, Jack, the director called, you know what to do when the mob comes on. You grab the girl in your arms, don't get excited and choke her, and then defy the mob to do their worst. You extra people, meaning me and the others, come up the street as if you were going to tear the girl to pieces, but stop when Kerrigan raises his hand and register fear and anger. Now let's try it. I don't think much of the leading woman, Clarabelle, and between us, I could have done much better. She didn't act a bit. She didn't wave her hands and grab her heart and yell, Spare me, spare me! And she was afraid of us, too. I could tell that by the way she ran up the street and hid behind Jack. If they had let me play that part, I would have shown them. I would have let down my hair and really done something. Mr. Cheney didn't like it either, for he said, Rotten, try it again and I want you extra people to come after her as if you meant it. Don't stop to comb your hair. I hadn't stopped to comb my hair at all, Clarabelle. I merely paused to fix one wayward tress that was tickling my nose, so I could not register fear or anger or both together. I would like to know how you could register fear or anger either, for that matter, while you were running as fast as your skirts would let you up the street. My book and elocution said to register fear by advancing the left foot and placing the hands, palm outward, in front of the face, but every time I stopped to do it, someone stepped on my heels and pushed me along. It was the most impolite mob I ever heard of. A lot of low people who never had any dramatic training. And that director, when I was doing my best, right up near Miss Sisson, and was acting all over the place, he calls to his assistant and says, Al, put that lens louse in the background. We have to have some of the principals in this scene. I looked into the camera but didn't say anything, and in a minute the fresh assistant come to where I was, and asked me to assist those in the rear of the mob. Goodness knows they needed assistance, dear, for all they were doing were waving clubs and shouting. So just to help them out, I went way in the back. When I was back there, Mr. Cheney said, There, thank goodness, we can get a mob scene now. Wasn't that a delicate little compliment? After we got through the scene, I went up and thanked him. I started to show him my diploma, and tell him who I really was, but he said, Don't, dearie, I have had a hard day's work, and I cannot stand another shock meaning, of course, Clarabelle, that he recognized genius in disguise. Well, dear, I must close now, and next time I will tell you about Mr. Turner shooting black box pictures. Give my love to all. Molly. I notice one of the stars in Keystone spells her name Grace, so here goes mine. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 3 
of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Third Reel Hollywood, California, May 12, 1915. Dear Clara Bell, Dearie, I have just gone off and left Universal Company flat. I am all through being first assistant to any one of their one dozen or more directors. There's probably those that will continue to sacrifice themselves for five bucks a day. But I still have my self-respect and a jitney ticket over the... over the pass. I don't know how you spell it, but it's pronounced like a lynching bee. Cahunga. This awful name stands forever between Los and Uni City. I've discovered my fort. I'm a queen of comedy. You better warn Grundy Center that I'm coming. Another year and I will have Mabel Norman back to her cloak model job, while yours as ever will be making the world laugh in her place. Do you want to know who told me? Nappy. You don't know who Nappy is? Well, he is Max Sennett, and what he is not at Keystone, well, what he isn't, isn't. He is called Nappy, not because he is sleepy, but after that great German general we read about in school, the one that met Josephine at Waterloo, or something like that. I never was much good at dates. First, dearie, I got to tell you about that trouble with Universal Company. Mr. Lamb may come himself and beg my return on bended knee, but I will not consent. I am a lady under all conditions, whether I forget it or not. Blood will tell, and besides, I am a prize winner, which means some class, anyway. My idol is broke. Kerrigan. I don't mean he hasn't the price of a nut sundae for his lunch. I mean he is not the noble character Grundy Center believes him to have been. To me he was the king among men. But when he began to barter his beauty to boost sport shirts, I didn't know what he would be plugging next, and I resolved to put him out of my heart. Roscoe R. Buckle is my ideal now, Clara Bell. He is large, with the airy grace of a traction engine, but a noble heart beats beneath his rugged, I mean deep, bosom. He is one of nature's noblemen. Knowing him intimate as I do, one would not call him fat. Rather he is mature, and in spite of his size, he is filled with the cut-uppishness of a schoolboy. I told him my idea of acting, and showed him my diploma, and he said, Believe me, if I was as funny as you— I would get thin from laughing. Clarabelle, I call that real unselfishness. Here is an important emotional star, and he recognized my talent, and said so the minute he met me. I think it is perfectly wonderful that he said I was funnier than he was. Of course, I don't want you to think I am going to take his job. I wouldn't stoop to such a thing. He is going to give me a stripe out of his bathing suit to remember him by, and I think I will cut it into strips, sew them together, and make a couch cover." My goodness, I certainly keep slipping from the university company. I was doing some important help-outs on the black box. Mr. Otis Turner was directing. At first he appeared to be a nice man, though fussy. But he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. You'll see. We was way down to the end of the ranch in a London street. I was supposed to be a street waif selling flowers. Now I've seen enough prominent actors in Grundy Center to know. You can't be a waif selling flowers unless it is snowing. So I waited till Mr. Turner got rehearsing us up in front. They call it the foreground. And then I told him I would have to have snow or I could never sell flowers. He answered, You don't need snow. You are a frost yourself. I don't get it exactly, but the mean way he snipped it off made some of them laugh. Then he apologized for the faults in the script, and I went back and done the best I could. Then they started the fog machines, the things they use in front of the camera to cover the principles. I thought it was to save us from getting wet during rehearsals. Well, Clarabelle, he hollered picture, and then action, and didn't turn on no more fog spray. I waited till he was about to holler camera, then I walked right through the scene, down, as we actresses say, and said as politely as though I was asking Pa for a nickel, Mr. Turner, I'm not getting no fog. He looked at me as though he would bust a blood vessel, and said finally, You are too doggone atmospheric for me. You better go to work for Tom Inch. Clarabelle, I looked at him as though I was Duchess of Somersault, and he a low snake in the grass. With that scornful toss of my brow for which I am noted, I said, I hope you get static. Then I left him. Of course, Clarabelle, I forget that you not being a woman of the world don't know what static is. It is a commonly used expression in our art. I asked the cameraman the spelling expressly to tell it to you. He told me a lot of scientific stuff, but the nut of the meat was that static is an actor's name for electricity. Wishing static on a person therefore means you hope his lights go out. In this instance, lights don't mean lungs. The first person to recognize me when I reached Keystone was Raymond Hitchcock. When they told me he was a very famous actor, I think I recognized him right away. 
is not he the fellow you and me saw in ten nights in a bar-room in grundy centre last december i asked him if he was in ten nights in a bar-room then and he said no cutie it was ten bars in a night but i have entirely forgot that show do you remember it dear well as i have said before it was roscoe who wanted me for his company he said to mr hitchcock gee i most certainly have that in my tank scene so they gave me a bathing suit and told me to put it on i'm blushing yet to my wrists when the wardrobe woman first handed it to me i thought it was winter flannels i cannot describe it but when they told me it was once worn by nettie kellerman the famous swimstress i was happy one must make sacrifices for art just think of poor margaret edwards who played the hip and hypocrites she had nothing but her contract to protect her while well, in the scene i was supposed to fall into the tank and mr arbuckle was to save me when i jumped into the thing it was so deep it went right over my head and i started to yell roscoe hollered kid keep the water outside of you or there won't be nothing for me to swim in and with that he leapt in and i recovered quickly as soon as i felt his strong arms about me when the scene was over and they had pumped me out mr sennett said my child you are the funniest thing i ever saw the cherry sisters would never have had a chance if you had been born when they was the cherry sisters i guess were famous moving picture queens twenty or thirty years ago clara bell well must close now as the van camps is boiling over on the gas jet and threatens to put me out of light more about roscoe next time love molly p s i have dropped the y in molly i asked mr arbuckle to write my name on a picture of himself and he didn't write a y so i won't either hollywood california may fourteenth nineteen fifteen dear clara bell i am writing you in sorrow i have learnt something that has broke my heart i might have known roscoe is married not only that but happily married and his wife is minta de free and though i do say so myself i think i could show her cards and spades on style any time even if i do only come from grundy centre and she's a great actress and the wife of a wonderful man and actor as the poet says man's a deceiver ever which i think is awful clever it certainly is something fierce i'm going to put my heart into cold storage it's pretty hard having idols shattered on you the way things have been going with me here if it wasn't for my art i think i'd fly back to mother's arms by the way she wrote me a long letter which i got this morning and told me not to make a fool of myself any more than possible can you beat that she don't seem to realize what a success i am old people never understand those things well clarabelle i was going to write you a long letter but my heart feels that weak and faint to-night after the discovery about roscoe but i guess i'll close and have a ham and pickle sandwich and go to bed good night dearie we'll write soon love molly End of chapter three This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 4 of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fourth Reel Hollywood, June 16th. Ma chérie, French, which I am being taught by a German cameraman. I just had to quit Keystone. Art may live long but I won't, if I make a darn martyr of myself for five dollars a day. I didn't mind being thrown in the tank and nearly drowned, nor did I get sore when they poured the soup all over my dress and then hit me with a turkey. I was willing to forget those little things, for the sake of the drama. But when Roscoe R. Buckle was to jump out of a three-story building, and I was supposed to have caught him in my waiting arms, I resigned. That is, Mr. Sennett told me to get out, and I got out, and after I got out I resigned immediately although I don't know whether he heard me. If I hadn't have objected, I was supposed to catch Roscoe and fall backwards into a wash-tub. That made me turn my back to the camera. And, Clarabelle, I ask you how you can get any soulfulness or temperament into your work when you got to fall into a tub with your back to the camera. Roscoe was consideration itself. He said he would let me jump out of the third-story window if I would stay, and he would catch me on the first bounce. And then, Clarabelle, snakes ain't actors. The profession is overcrowded enough as it is without bringing in any more reptiles. And that is just what Raymond Hitchcock did. I had no scenes with him, but the very thought of having them around upset my delicate nerves. I put Roscoe out of my life, because he would tell Ford stories, and any man that will do that is not a suitable mate for a woman of genius. Mr. Arbuckle was all cut up when I quit. 
he breathed in my ear just before i left that he never never in all his life enjoyed throwing things at anybody as he did at me he said he could get more expression and emotional feeling into a brick coming my way than with any other actress he had ever met he certainly is a grand man i suppose you've seen an item in the grundy center paper that universe beauty special passed through there in route here my dear i was down to the train to see them come in far be it from me to denounce my own sex but if i was the other candidates i would insist on a recount it is not for me to praise myself dear but if i haven't got it over that whole crowd like a tent for looks i'll go back to murdering the strip tickets now don't breathe this to a soul clarabelle but certain parties out here jealous of my success and the sensation i've made have been knocking me to the directors i know the hussy and when the moon is right i am going to alter her map so there will be no chance for a retake i do not believe in fighting or even quarrelling with low common people once a lady always a lady so be assured that i will not soil my hands on her i will just one day wrap a stage brace around her summer furs cheap catskin my dear so hard she would think she played the lead in a four real earthquake how are all the rubes back in grundy center my god how i pity them lovingly yours molly p s i just seen by the paper that wait till i get that paper to see how it's spelt geraldine farrar the grand opera prima donna is going to sing for the pictures at the lasky studio and i am going right out there and accept an engagement if it is offered me you know dear i sang illustrated ballads between reels at grundy center and i am sure that the presence of a sister artist there would make mrs farrar feel more at home hollywood june twenty ninth dear clara bell the grandest news miss farrar and me are working together in the same picture and not a bit of jealousy i don't know the name of the picture but it's just grand costumes and knives and donkeys and goats etc and everything the scenes is laid in some wap country where colored clothes is popular and you know me in red clarabelle when i came on first time in my costume everybody just quit acting as soon as i had of seen miss farrar was here i beat it right out to the lasky studio and told peggy powell i would accept an engagement in her company what you would really consent to work with miss farrar says mrs powell certainly even though she isn't one of a screen artists answered i promptly i am a graduate which is more than she can say here is my diploma line forms on the left says mrs powell can you play an italian my favorite flower is garlic answered i and i was engaged for miss farrar's support miss farrar has a beautiful dressing-room right near mine it has a piano and everything just lovely and she practices in there every morning i told mr horwitz i guessed i would have to practice too to have my voice cultivated for the pictures and he promised to get me a mouth organ after he had of went away i thought it over and now i ask you clara b how can i chorkle like a thrush and accompany myself on a mouth organ i asked mr wyckoff how it could have been done and he said take a double exposure percy told me not to sing at all as the light was getting bad percy is only a cameraman dearie but he is the soul of a true artist and unless he can get a backlight on something his whole day is spoiled i believe i could care for him if it wasn't for his hair red my dear i was terrifically disappointed in miss farrar she's not like a prima donna at all that is she's not like i'd be if i had the praise of thousands at my feet i can see a director telling me what to do and she hasn't even a velvet carpet from her dressing-room to the stage and her dress let me tell you about her dress cotton my dear and cheap at that will you believe me when i told you that sears roebuck wouldn't know it as the last year's model if i had her salary silks and satins for me and a gleam with precious jewels to boot and never would i step under a diffuser i must summon by the director himself and then if i didn't feel like it i would recline in my boudoir and tell him to change the hair on one of the extries before i sauntered forth she goes right ahead and does scene after scene without resting just one spasm after another you know no one of her rank can do that and maintain her artistic poise and if i do have to say it in some parts of my chosen profession i am a whole lot ranker than she is if i would have been her i would have had a chocolate sundae served me by a livered servant after every big spell and as for singing clarabelle would you believe it when i tell you that she don't make faces nor suck in her breath nor nothing to show that she is working at all i'm a judge of music as all grundy center has admitted and i will say that she has a good voice even though it isn't loud i know because i was listening to her practice and there were several places where she could have yelled right out but she didn't do it maybe she wasn't feeling well or maybe this is the new school i don't know as to that 
but i do know i was educated in the old-fashioned yell opera technique and i don't regret it you know what great artist it was who complimented my vocal organ by saying i had the loudest range he had ever heard still i enjoyed assisting her here charity has taught me to be kind to others and help them all i can even though i can't sometimes see their stuff i don't believe in familiarity so i keep my distance in our scenes together as i have said i enjoyed the whole engagement it was a whole day when the picture is released my dear look for me in the blue dress right behind the star i am about forty feet away and there are fifteen people between us and i'm faced the other way but if anybody moved out of the way during the picture you can see who it is i guess by the way during that scene mr de mille paid me the most delicate little compliment in that charming way of his i started to have faced the camera and he said girlie don't do that your back is far more expressive it was done in that gracious manner of nature's nobleman and so sincere for a moment i was thrilled and if somebody hadn't to push the mule cart on my corns i might have blushed dearie i could learn to care for that man if he wasn't so careless in his clothes he wears a rough shirt and boots but believe me if i came from the metropical opera like miss farrar nobody would direct me unless he was within his prince albert i like the artistic air of the lasky studio it is so soothing to my nerves i am in my proper spear and you don't have to jump into no tanks or do nothing rough and i certainly was the photograph of a lady in that red dress i think i will ignore all other and become a regular member of the lasky company i know i could get in if the fence wasn't so darn high yours as before molly p s when you see me in the watt picture don't forget to look at farrar she don't do much but what she does is all right i guess it must be or mr de mille would have had a retake oh why doesn't he wear a prince albert m This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 5 of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifth Reel. Hollywood, July 12, 1915. Dear Clarabelle, Of course I have told you the way some of these stars is acting over the success I have been making in the silent drama how they would all go up stage and refuse to go on as long as I was in sight. Well, I was a permanent member of the Lasky All-Star Stock Company, for a few minutes, and could have soon been running Blanche Sweet a close second, when the blow-off came. It was this way. Me and Geraldine Farrar, and Mr. DeMille and all of us, went down to take the bullfight scenes in Carmen, which, by the way, hasn't got a darn thing to do with cars, but tells all about a lot of wops, at the stadium. Yes, that's the right spelling before twenty thousand of the elite of los angeles when the bull saw me and refused to go on wouldn't that fog your film even the dumb animal knew he was running up against an artist when all this happened i hadn't started to act at all i was just getting my face in shape to register excitement and surprise when the bull crabbed the act it was a shame too clarabelle although i was only one of the twenty thousand i knew my work was so distinctive that i would stand out above all the others I had it all doped out to do a feint and a comedy fall into the bull ring and hand the bull a hunk of hay in a jaunty manner that would have got me a job for life some jealous cat must have told the bull for when he came into the ring he was as mad as all get out clarabelle i never did see a bull so mad i wouldn't go near him he actually acted rough and not like a refined animal at all i had a hunch that i would be blamed for it so i snuck out of the grandstand and rambled for home believe me clarabelle you could have played checkers on my mantilla all the way to Hollywood. Mr. DeMille is a lovely man, and has a nice disposition, but they say when he gets mad, he would just as soon as not go right down into the ring and run the bull ragged. Since that time, I have not been back. Tomorrow I am going down and see David Work Griffith, the director. I have seen them gish girls, and they don't do a lot of things before the camera, that I would, and I am going to tell Mr. Griffith about it. I know if he had ever have seen my diploma— he would have given me the part of the clam and the clamsman just as well as not. Well, there's a fire sale of beef stew down at one of the cafeterias, and I think I will attend. All for now. Love, Molly. Hollywood, July 20. Dear Clarabelle, Them that like this battle stuff can have it, but not for me, never no more. I just assaulted the Alamo for David Griffith, and I am off conflicts for life. If I was those soldiers in the trenches, I would just drop the whole thing and go home bullfights is bad enough but battle stuff has it looking like sinful idleness those mutual reliance 
correct spelling studios is a terrible place bernie seedman told me that people had been lost in there for days at a time and they kept dogs there to go out and hunt missing persons it's all right to start into but once when you get inside unless you carry a map you are gone i am offered an engagement for one day as a spanish senorita for mr chris cabani who is putting on the alamo the man said go right back on the stage but believe me clarabelle before i found the stage it was time to quit for lunch you are as apt to end up in a property room as to find the stage you want they say the thing was built by a chinaman who went bug house designing puzzles while well, i was rambling around trying to find cabani and his alamo i runs right into mr griffith there he was sitting on the stage with his company around him telling them about the script not that i wanted to get may marsh's job or anything like that but i horned right in and sat down with the rest of them mr griffith called me over and right there is where the argument started he pushed back my tresses to take a peek at my forehead and as he turned away he said something i claim he said beautiful while there are others who insist he said bovine i don't know what the last word means but from the actions of some of the cats present i feel that there is a veiled knock in it then mr griffith told me i had better run along and not keep mr cabany waiting so i stepped right along but i know i made an impression for as i left he said and they kill people like lucretia bargia i don't know who the lady is but anyway her name is not in who is which in filmland mr cabany is a nice little man with a charlie chaplin mustache sam de grasse is in the picture he is a nice man but he has a mean part clarabelle i could never fall in love with a villain juanita hansen is the leading woman she seemed to be all right but never acted enough but would do only what the director told her how can those poor nuts know what fire burns in a woman's bosom we were working in interior sets all day with a lot of shooting and things and were just getting ready to go home when mr cabani said be back at eight o'clock for some night stuff what do you think of taking motion pictures at night this was the attack in the alamo over in a vacant lot near the studio i was one of the brave defenders inside the building and the mexicans were attacking us from the outside everybody was shooting away when i get an idea that would have helped the scene wonderfully so all i did was to open one of the big doors and walk over to where mr cabani was directing by the camera and asked him in a quiet ladylike voice if i couldn't save a child or something with a prop kid i could have done a dandy close-up sliding down a rope or something he didn't take it in the helpful spirit i meant at all you know dear some people hate to have suggestions made them he is one of them i came darn near going over to tom wilson and asking him to come back long enough to hand the fresh director a haymaker needless to say i resigned at once i would not lend my art to any guy who dished up the language he did no one in hollywood slept while he was doing the picture and i hope he gets pinched for disturbing the peace when i was over taking my makeup off one of the extra girls had the nerve to bawl me out for cutting in on the scene you ought to know better than spoil a couple of miles of perfectly good film by horning in that way she says the idea she said walking right across the foreground when that big battle was going on you are darn lucky not to have been beamed by a wad from one of those guns if i had been the director i would have stuck you head first into one of the cannon and to let it rip if your mind was under diffusers she says to me there would be enough room in it to stage all the scenes of the clamsmen at once i wish you could have saw the look i gave her clarabelle all i said was how your artistic temperament ever got you away from the wash-tub is more than i can imagine with that i sauntered out when it comes to a call down clarabelle i am there none of them have got anything on me i'll bet if i had have shown her my diploma she would have felt even worse these here stars can't make me forsake my art i got a nice room and a landlady who is not in too much of a hurry and i am eating regularly i'll make these directors appreciate my talents if i have to start a company of my own i got to write to the ten dollar mary pickford for a new diploma this one is nearly wore out write soon love molly p s one thing i like about the movies is that it keeps you out in the open air so far that is about the only place i have been End of chapter five This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 6 of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sixth Reel. Hollywood, August 18th. Dear Clarabelle, 
None of these other moving picture actorines has got anything on me now. I got a personal press agent. It happened in the strangest way. I had have been noticing a tall, handsome gent that dines in my favorite cafeteria about the same time I do, and the way he looked at me with languishing eyes, and the other day we met quite informally. I had my tray laden down with forty-nine cents worth of food, and was using both hands to restrain it, and it was while I was trying to get some lump sugar out of the bowl with my teeth for my java that he sprung to my assistance. One word led to another, you know how it is in society, and before long we were sitting at the same table. I told him how the jealousy of the other moving picture stars was a keeping me down, and he said, well, you ought to have a press agent, that's all. I told him I belonged to a pressing club in Grundy Center, but I couldn't use one now as I was wearing wash dresses and doing them myself in the bathroom. That is when the landlady don't catch me. He laughed. I don't know why, because wash dresses is certainly sensible this time of year. And then he said that is not the kind I mean. I mean a man to put pieces and pictures in the papers and make you notorious like all these other stars. He then told me he was a journalist and had taken such an interest in my art that he would do it for nothing. He said to me, Girly, he says, I'm going to give you a big write-up in the next issue of my magazine. A whole paragraph. I was that overjoyed. He is editor of the Beekeeper's Annual, and the next issue is out next Fourth of July, and I can't hardly wait. Just think of seeing my name in print. Won't Grundy Center be proud of my notoriety? And right on top of that good fortune, I nearly lost my own life. Never did I face death so close before, since the time I moved in a still for George Malford out to Lasky's. On my way out to Inchville, I stepped into a rut and sunk out of sight in the dust. If some cowpuncher had not have thrown me a rope, you would have wept when you got my letter, because I wouldn't have wrote it. Inchville is a nice place for any explorer to go after. You take a train to Santa Monica, a streetcar to the end of the line down by the Jap Fishingburg, and there wait for a bus. There are those that has made it all the same day. Inchville is named after Mr. Thomas Inch, the big boss there. I was told that Mr. Inch's press agent, Mr. O'Hara, named it that to get a raise, but one cannot believe all the idle gossip they hear. Anyway, it has the ocean on one side, and is pasted against cliff on the other. You can fall off the top of the highest stage, right into the raging surf. Some do. Now I know how those poor people in the Alps must suffer. You are either climbing upstairs, or down all the time. The six stages seem right one on top of the other. They tell me that the man who laid it out was jealous of Seattle. When I first arrived, I thought from sounds they took animal pictures, for someone was trying to tease a lion, but one of the girls said no, it was only Scott Sidney taking a death scene, so I went in without fear. I guess I told you how they wanted me to double for Daniel in the lion's den, at Seelig's, didn't I? Since that moment I fought shy of beasts. They were so busy getting ready for Bill Burke, some Irish actress, they tell me. She has some piece she is going to do when she gets there about the liquor traffic. It's a scotch piece, and I can't drink the bile stuff. While I was standing there, Mr. W. S. Hart drove up on top of a horse. My, he does look handsome in his cowboy uniform. Well, no, I would say more dashing than handsome. My, but women are deceitful. I saw Bessie Barris Kale, one of the stars, coming out of her dressing room to start a climb to work, and she was a blonde. You remember in the rows of the ranch house she was a perfect brunette? I saw Rhea Mitchell. She is hired to play ingenue leads, but to my mind she wasn't a bit girlish. She didn't slap anybody with her fan, or chew the end of her handkerchief, like I would have done, if had it been her. I went right out and hunted up Mr. Inch. He was on one of the topmost stages, looking at a scene with one eye shut. I heard a girl say that he had his camera eye on a scene. It wasn't so at all. I guess I should know, because I have looked into enough of them. Of course, it may have been just a glass eye, but what would he have shut the good one for? I am not like other girls. They can't put those silly things over on me. Well, I busted right in and said, Mr. Inch, I will accept a position as your ingenue. He looked at me a moment and said, You are not constructed right. Ingenues have to have skinny legs and long lashes to be ingenues. And while goodness knows you are skinny enough, something must have etch your eyelashes off while you slut. The first thing you want to do is grow a new crop of eyelashes. What's the next thing? I asked. See some other director, he says. I thank the poor simp and laughed. What can he know of the emulsions that lurk in a woman's soul by looking at her eyelashes? I got a chance of a fine engagement week after next that I may accept if someone don't get there ahead of me. So must close now and get dinner. I'm dining in my room now that the landlady has a cold and can't smell nothing. Love, Molly. August 25th. Dear Clara Bell, What do you know about this Anita King getting selected for an auto ride all by herself from here to New York? I seen her in a picture out to Lasky's 
and she don't look to me like she could drive old Henry's depot a hack, much less an automobile. Asked one of the boys down to Inchville about it. I said, why do they select Miss King to go across, when I have so much spare time? He says, because she has so much nerve and personality. I says, well, I got them. And he says, kid, you sure have. If you was a French girl, your nerve would take you right to Berlin. But your personality wouldn't give you a jitney ride to Ocean Park, and Ocean Park is one mile away. I says, I don't want to go to Ocean Park. I want to go to New York. He says, what's the matter with loss? Meaning Los Angeles. And I answers, nothing. But I want to go in an open automobile to New York, and get my features in print, and become notorious in everything. He says, they have let you stay here this long without being arrested. So don't take no chances by moving. Oh, the landlady just sent word I am wanted on the phone. Maybe at last the managers have come to their senses. We'll close. Love, Molly. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 7 of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seventh Reel. September 15, 1915. Clara Bell. I got a darn good notion to leave the silent drama flat and come back home. Not that I ain't popular in my art, because I have already worked two days this week, and it is only Saturday now. But I am so homesick that Pie hasn't tasted the same to me since Tuesday. I have been out to the Selig Zoo, working in the Chronicles of Bloomer Center. This set reminded me so of Grundy Center, on a busy day, that I sat right down and cried, regardless of makeup. I was a-setting there sobbing all over the map, when Mr. Persons comes up and says to me, he says, After you get through with this picture, let me know, and I will put you to work with the cats. I told Bessie Eiton what he said, and how I loved the kittens. She said, Huh, he must be trying to cut down his meat bill. Dearie, I learned that them cats and Mr. Persons is a flock of raging lions. I have often said that animals ain't what you might call legitimate actors, and up to now I have refused to work with them, because I never have been in a studio where there was any, and I had never been asked. But if Kathleen Williams can do it, I guess I can. I asked Mr. Ralph McComas about them, and he said all you have to do is to look them right in the eye, and they ache with fear. He said the human eye had wonderful influenza on a lion, and he had known them to lay down and die just from being looked at. He advised me not to look too hard, or I might kill them all off. He said I should put dimmers on my lamps, so as to take no chances. You know, dear, all of the traveling gentlemen that stopped in Grundy Center said I had beautiful eyes. So if them lions get fresh with me, I'll curl them up with a glance. Remember how I withered that shoe drummer that said he knew I was a country bell because I looked like a string bean? Some wither. I ain't keen about this Bloomer Center stuff. It is nice for fine work and all that, but I have to wear my own clothes when I crave to be dolled up like a queen in a book in purple and vermine. I'm not the girl to brag about myself, Clarabelle, but when I'm garbaged in silks and satins with one of these here Queen Elizabeth ruffs and a heavy veil— I am a nifty looker. You know that newspaper friend of mine? The sporting editor of the Beekeeper's Annual? He's just the loveliest man. So attentive. Twice already he has called up this week to know if I had been at by them animals. Said he didn't want to get scooped or something like that. He has given me the grandest presents. Two copies of the Annual, so I can read the words he has penned. He is a very talented writer, he told me, and could turn out lots better stories than this guy Chambers, or London, or Dickens. That is, if he could only think of them. He admitted that. In a burst of confidence the other night, he said that a lot of the magazines were sore at him, because he wouldn't quit the beekeepers and go to work for them. He showed me a lot of slips from the magazines, rejecting his stuff to prove it. He wears his hair long, and a turned-down collar, and a Windsor tie. So he must be a genius. His name is Cuthbert de Vignette. Ain't that gosh hanged romantic? And I've got his picture hanging up over the crack in the mirror. He said that a writer could bear his heart on enduring paper that would live through ages, but that some soused machine operator with a lighted cigarette could blow up a whole building with some screen artist's life work. He told me that a woman with my depth and my soul and my brain should be a wonderful inspired writer, and to give me a start, he is going to let me, under his guidance, address circulars down in his office. It will be a doggone sight better for me to sway the world with my pen for years to come, than to hand a Monday matinee audience a giggle with twenty feet of comedy fall down a flight of steps. The man cast a spell over me, dearie, 
and I feel myself sort of fading out on the photodrama. I hear his feet step now. I must fly to him. Love, Molly. September 25th, 1915. Dear Clara Bell, I just had a session with the Malayans, and I am plumb beat out. If I ever get a hold of that McComas person that told me that animals quaked before the human eye, he won't even be a speck on the lens. Clara Bell, don't you believe that a lion gives a hang about the human eye? It's the human limb that beast is interested in. After I finished with the what you call it of Bloomer Center, I, like a boob, let Mr. Persons, at Seelig's, give me that job with the cats he was talking about. The most vicious lion on the place it was, and according to the script, I was supposed to be the lion's little playmate, a child of the jungle, it said. Some fresh assistant director handed me a welcome mat to wear for a skin robe, shoved me in behind a cage door, and said, go on, be a child of nature. My dear, I looked around and there was a lion the size of an elephant. I looked him right in the eye, but he wouldn't look at me, but kept coming right along. I looked at him until I doggone near strained my eyes, and then I made a dash for the side fence and clumb right up the wires to the top, and when there, believe me, I called for assistance in no uncertain manner. The trainer hollered and said, what are you trying to do, scare the lion to death? And I says, well, it's fifty-fifty, and they took me out. I think I'm cut out for a homebody anyway, and if Cuthbert just gives me a chance, I will grab him and abandon my professional career. I feel I could be a second Laura Eugene Libby if I had the right dope. Love, Molly. End of chapter. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 8 of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Last Reel. Hollywood, November 4. My God, Clarabel, I am about to become a bride. I make haste to dash this news off to you, so when you see my wedding announcement, you will not be nonplussed. Before long, unless there is a breakdown somewhere, I will be Mrs. Cuthbert Clemenceau Pontiff. When dear Cuthbert got himself nerved up enough to breathe the fatal words, I leaped into his waiting arms like a tiger upon a defenseless goat, and as I nestled my head into his waiting bosom, and darn near broke his specks, we blighted our troth. Whatever that is. I knew that Cuthbert was a-going for to ask me to commit matrimony, and coy and maiden-like I did not give him a chance to duck. It was all so romantic it seems like a five-reel Mary Pickford. I know you will like Cuthbert, if I ever bring him back to Grundy Center. He is not what you would call handsome, but he has such noble thoughts. Beautiful eyes, my dear, beautiful. Of course some may say he squints a little, but you would never notice it when his head is turned the other way. His teeth, Clarabel, are the most prominent thing about him. In fact, it was his teeth I noticed first. They sort of stick out, like a couple of tombstones on a dark night, and the cutest Adam's apple. Honest, sometimes you think it is going to jump up and knock his hat off. During our courtship, he treated me like a princess of royal blood. When we were whining and dining at the cafeteria, he always saw that I had plenty of mashed potatoes, and lots of times I have had six glasses of water, without him saying a word. And toothpicks. Would you believe it, Clarabel? I have enough toothpicks for my trousseau right now. Liberal with his money, too. Almost every time we go sightseeing in the electric, he pays both fares. He's told me often that he had just as soon spend a nickel as go through a San Francisco earthquake any time. Cuthbert says I'm going to be such a help to him when we are wed. Even now he lets me stick the stamps on the envelopes that are to carry his deathless words to the great magazines, and then when they come back he lets me look, to see if there are any the post office people fail to mark. Of course, Cuthbert don't make much money. He says geniuses never do, until after they are dead. But he is going to have me retire from the stage and get a regular job. Something that will not interfere with my home life. Taking and washing, for example. Cuthbert says he has written a number of articles, proving that a woman's place is in the home, and he is sure he can get enough for me to do to keep me there. We are going to have the wedding solemnized as soon as he can find justice of the peace that ain't all corruption and greed, and is willing to send two loving hearts, hand in hand, down the paths of life, just for the experience. Cuthbert says it would spoil his whole married life if he had to pay for a wedding. I have played in my last picture, and I heard it rumored that all the directors are going to get together and send me a vote of thanks. Ain't that just too sweet for words? Everybody seems glad to hear that I'm going to get married. They tell me a lot of these female stars are biting their fingernails down to the quick and jealous rage. Must close now, as I have to meet Cuthbert. 
Already he is training me in the housewifely arts by rehearsing me darning the holes in his socks. Lovingly, Molly. Hollywood, November 15. Dear Clara Bell, Our wedding has been consummate, and I am now a honest-to-goodness wife. We have the cunningest little home, two rooms and a fire escape, and when the curtains are up in the windows of the next flat, we can see right through out into the street. Our wedding was delayed a little, on account of the fact that Cuthbert could not find a justice of the peace that wanted to give a marriage ceremony just for the exercise, and we had to hang around a couple of days, getting a crowd of brides and grooms together so we could get an excursion rate. Cuthbert is now busy getting out a very bitter article on the corruption and greed of political grafters. After we were wed, we went on a bridal tour at the Catalinian Islands, which lay in the ocean near here, all surrounded by water. It is a beautiful trip, but rough, and at times I wish that Cuthbert and I had never met. But it was lovely after we got over there. You have to go by boat. We came back the same day, and then the next day we hunted our little nest. I just love the little place. It is so cute, and especially nice when the people downstairs ain't cooking onions. Right away, the day after we were wed, I got a job. I met a director I worked for once, and after I told him I was a war bride, and he said he would get me a job assisting the hash director in the cafeteria, out to the studio. It is real lovely, and I get a chance to study the mode of eating of the famous stars that work there. Cuthbert says he thinks he will get some kind of a drug habit and be a scenario writer. He says you gotta smoke or sniff something to be a good scenario writer to help you get the ideas. I'll bet he could write good ones, too, if he could only think of them. Wouldn't it be lovely if he was a scenario writer and got a job out here and we could work side by side? He dealing out junk for the director, and me a dealing out beans for the actors. Well, I must quit now, for Cuthbert will be waiting to see if I got any tips today. I don't know when I'll have a chance to write again. Love, Mrs. Cuthbert Clemsa Pontif. Knee, Molly. P.S. Knee is French for once was. End of chapter 8. End of Molly of the Movies. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.